Welcome back to Talk of the Town on 99.7, 1450WHTC and WHTC.com. And we welcome you back to Talk of the Town for this Monday, March 8th. I'm Gary Stevens. It's the second Monday of the month in our 1030 segment. On the second Monday of the month, we normally devote to talking about things going on in Lansing with one of the people that uh, represents the Lakeshore in the state house. She is Mary Whiteford, the third term Republican representative from Casco Township in the far southwest corner of Allegan County. She joins us now via the Zoom connection. Mary, good morning and welcome back to Talk of the Town. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, everybody. Glad you are able to join us. And if you have a question for Mary, she'll be happy to answer it at 395-1450-395-1450. I'll throw you a little curveball. I'm not certain whether or not you are participating, but we got a press release from the Allegan County uh, Republican Party about the roar effort to try to uh, Open up the restaurants a little bit more. It's coming up this Saturday. A number of restaurants are participating as well. I'm not certain how much you are aware of this, but certainly uh, the governor relaxing efforts to uh, uh, stop the spread of COVID-19, 50% capacity or 100 persons max, but these restaurants say they need to have more. Yeah, I did hear about that. I saw the press release as well. I think it's just a way to support some hardworking restaurant owners and bring attention and just be there for them. They've had such a difficult time. And um, I know quite a big group is planning on attending. I'm going to do my best to attend as well. I also have a Boy Scout thing that day, a crossing over <laughs> event in Allegan, So, But we cannot underestimate the negative impact the shutdown has been on our local biz uh, restaurant owners. Many of these towns, like I'll go through Hopkins, or Martin and just so many of these towns, the core business is the restaurant there. And they live locally, they provide a lot of food and services to the best of their ability, but we really have to make sure that um, we support them as we these restrictions are being eased. Now, the question then is for those who are supportive of the restrictions in the uh, dining aspect, well, you can support them with the takeouts but not every restaurant really is suited for, for takeouts. And, you know, it, it, some of the charm is if you're driving through an area, you'll be able to sit down, have a nice meal, share time with people. And, and yet you can't do that when you, you know, when you have takeaway stuff and that doesn't work too well. You know, the decision has to be up to every single person. I mean, if you feel comfortable doing carry out, do carry out. If you feel comfortable going in the restaurant, be vigilant, go into the restaurant. Um, that's what it comes down to with these restrictions easing. I mean, I still think this virus is deadly. It makes people really sick, uh, but the vaccination is getting out there. There's a, many people who have gotten their vaccine and we just have to keep moving forward like that. Hey, if you don't even feel comfortable doing carry out, just eat at home, right? And make your own food. <laughs> but uh, some of us are good about that. Others, well, <laughs> let's have somebody else do it. I, you know, I, I, anyway, uh, 395-1450, <laughs> 395-1450. If you have a question for state representative, Mary Whiteford, uh, as a member of the house appropriations committee, of course, you have a subcommittee that you chair you and other members of the house appropriations committee, as well as the Senate appropriations committee, uh, normally it would be in person, obviously a little different now, but uh, the uh, Whitmer administration formally presented its proposed spending plan for fiscal 2022 on Thursday, probably a very lengthy statement, very, you know, normally, you know, big, thick, uh, five inch uh, statement, but to be honest with you, how much have you been able to digest? What have you seen? What things does the government governor wants to do that maybe is doable? And what things is, are, is she proposing that, frankly, uh, uh, she's just hoping to be able to get some uh, political mileage more than anything else out of? So are you talking about the current budget supplemental? Uh, no, I'm talking about the proposed 2021, oh. uh, 22, okay. 2022. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate that question. This is all part of the process. It's been around since the beginning of governors and appropriations processes and legislators. So the governor made a proposal. Um, I am currently working on my DHHS budget 
which is just over $26 billion. What's really great about it, it's a safety net. We can find a lot of common ground. Uh, the governor, of course, is going to make recommendations and show her priorities. Well, one of my priorities is going to be foster children and the child welfare system. I am chair of the uh, Adoption of Foster Care Task Force work group, one of those. Um, and it's a six month process I'm going through finding out what is the what is the holdout? Why are kids oftentimes forgotten? Why aren't foster parents feeling like they're being listened to? Why do at the court level do the guardian ad litem? So that's the attorney who's assigned to every single child in protective services. Why do they feel so overwrought? Um, far too many children that they are the personal attorney for. So there's a lot of great things that we can um, focus on. And I'm going to make an interim recommendation prior to the final recommendation from the task force. But we can agree on that. But a lot of the budget is health care. And um, there's not a lot that I can change. I can't cut off health care and Medicaid um, benefits for people who need it so bad. Um, one thing that I really want to work on, we've got our local community mental health. We've heard about that a lot in Ottawa County. They also have a special millage to help our developmentally disabled people or people with serious mental illness. Elegant County, we don't have that, but there's still a way for us to make sure that services are consistent across the state, that people, that actually the mental health code is upheld. Um, we can't go and just cut off services from somebody who needs it. And so I've got a proposal out there. I'm working with the department to make sure we have more oversight, more consistency. So it's, it's not as bad as it all comes out. There's a lot of politicizing, but I'll do my best to just keep it real with everybody and say what the challenges really are. Is there a concern that some of these needs and some of, that you, some of the things you are fighting for might be overshadowed by what's the efforts to try to get everybody back to, you know, a little equilibrium and a little balance back from the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation. And of course, the governor is reiterating uh, one of her campaign pledges to fix the <clears throat> roads, and she wants to work on that. Do you get a sense that perhaps some of these other aspects, some of the things you are you are championing, championing on uh, might be pushed to the side because it doesn't have the quote unquote glamour of some of the other high profile topics? You know, I've always said that because I've heard over and over since I first was um, a state representative, the challenges that people face with the mental health and getting access to care. And I've just always focused on that. And then through the COVID time and the isolation and the sheer number of um, substance use disorder, I mean, even the amount of alcohol purchased this past year was 20% greater than the previous year. Um, kids killing themselves. I mean, this is really serious. So I'm just going to keep that big old barge moving forward, making sure that that's a priority. And I've really developed some great relationships with people who really care. And I'm just going to keep my foot on the pedal on that, on the gas pedal. 395-1450-395-1450. If you have a question for State Representative Mary Whiteford, she'll be happy to take it at 395-1450. Story coming out of Texas, uh, or stories, I should say, plural, coming out of Texas over the last week or two, um, where we've had situations where um, the federal agents have had to make busts of people trying to get illegals, uh, uh, um, trying to smuggle people into this country. Uh, we're getting questions, and uh, not questions, but stories about uh, uh, um, a swarm of children hitting the U.S. border from Latin America, unaccompanied children, and the concerns about not having enough beds and the possibility of human trafficking laws and charges being filed down there. But even though we're, you know, on the other side of the country in this particular matter, human trafficking, and that's something you've been very much a part of, uh, is, still, is still something that we need to keep an eye on, and you're working on it on your end. Yeah, we really do. It's not going away. Uh, I set up a special work group back in January that includes FBI agents who specialize in human trafficking. They're going and rescuing people, um, men, women, children. Um, and I've been talking to a lot of the victors, so people who were formerly trafficked who are going out and advocating for um, people who are being trafficked currently and trying to find those safe spaces to go. So it's real. 
regardless of how important or how much we hear in the news, there's bus going on. Um, so one of the things I was really fortunate to do was use my committee as a way to raise awareness on human trafficking. I did it last year. We had somebody from the uh, Human Trafficking Commission in the Attorney General's office come and they had worked on quite a large bill package, 30 bills to tighten up the things that we're missing in Michigan. We brought it down to 23 bills, bipartisan, um, introduced it last year, um, unable to advance it because of COVID and we hardly had any session days. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I held a committee hearing again, just a few weeks ago on human trafficking in January. So actually over a month ago, and we reintroduced that whole package. I presented it to the Judiciary Committee this past Tuesday and gave a history of legislation in the country all the way down to Michigan. We've only had laws for 21 years on the books at a national level. We've been bringing our FD grade because Polaris Project actually assigns grades to states on how they're doing to a B plus, but now we have a package that's even more expansive and the biggest thing I believe, and that's the bill I have, is that somebody who is trafficked, exploited, currently, if it, they have a prostitution charge, they can go to a judge and have it removed. But they don't have, the, there's no laws in place to let a judge expunge any other crimes that occurred while that person was being trafficked. So now, when this gets advanced and signed into law, somebody who has been trafficked, exploited, whether it's labor trafficking, sex trafficking, then they can go and have any other charge. So like they, a drug charge or stealing something from a store, anything along there, they can have a judge consider to remove and give that person a blank slate and a new start at life. Now, the, the thing is, uh, when we talk about human trafficking, there is a perception that perhaps the most fertile area for human trafficking would be I don't want to put aspersions on our uh, cartage and uh, logistics industry truck stops. Am I being oversimplifying this saying that that is, you know, maybe the perception of where human trafficking really is uh, uh, done and it can be done in any sort of way, or am I hitting the right chord saying, you know, the truck stops are one place that you can be able to spot human trafficking a little bit easier than others. That's a really good question. I've talked to probably 50, personally talked to over 50 people who have been trafficked. Every single one of their stories is different, but the biggest theme is it's, okay, so here's a girl. Usually they're about 15 years old when they're first trafficked into sex. And so the one woman I spoke to, her family was in a crisis. Her parents weren't paying attention to her. She found somebody who was really nice to her, an older man, gave her gifts, became a friend with him. And then literally went away with him to have a better life. The entire time he was grooming her to exploit her. And that's a friend of mine who has testified before my committee as well. There's also, and this is where my uh, adoption and foster care task force is kind of melding things in. There's a lot of foster children who age out of the system. And within three years, one person told me they're either drug addicted, pregnant, or in jail if they don't have a proper support system. So you picture somebody who, you, know, you could even call them throwaway children. And it's tragic, but here's children who don't have a champion. They don't have somebody looking out for them, making them feel value in their life. They find somebody who they feel is trustworthy and they walk right away with them. So most, most of the times I hear somebody who's being trafficked physically walks with their, um, walks away with that person, thinking that person cares and then they get trafficked and exploited. That's why it's really important for us to look out for all of our kids. You know, if you have a child in your life, make that connection. So if that child feels afraid or wants to confide in somebody, you can be their champion and be their person. Yeah, you brought up a good point about the fact that uh, maybe I'm thinking a generation ago when we didn't have a lot of online access and perhaps more online than actual personal access about picking up a hitchhiker at a place and, and, and coming that situation. Yeah. The online uh, certainly would be a very enticing situation. It's kind of, and, and you really, you know, mom and dad or the guardian need to be able to police that because you, you know, you can't have, can't have officers looking online all the time, especially either in the regular web or the 
dark web, as they say. Yeah. That, that and sometimes we have to have those uncomfortable conversations. And that's why almost every person I've been trafficked had seen a healthcare provider. So that's why we have training that is mandated for every single nurse in the state who might come into contact with somebody who's been exploited. Um, Ascension Hospital, which they just acquired Algen with an Algen Hospital within the past few months, they have one of the top, they actually got some funding to set up a pilot to, to make sure that their hospitals, every one of their facilities has a process and a procedure if they see somebody who's been exploited. Um, and they're gonna start being kind of the, the leader among all hospital systems in how we address it. Um, but it's got to be all of the above approach. But I do think every one of us has the um, ability to be a person for a child. Another topic, Mary, that you are passionate about is dealing with the nursing uh, uh, industry. Of course, that's uh, you know, right up your alley. But the nurse, nurse and I'm going to butcher this, anesthetist yeah. bill uh, uh, that you have right now to sort of help uh, that aspect of the, the industry out. Yep. You said it pretty darn good. Good job, Gary. <laughs> so the nurse anesthetist bill. So um, nurses have the ability to go and get advanced education. And there's a very, very special program to be a nurse anesthetist and to be able to safely uh, give um, anesthetics, things to make somebody go to sleep and not feel the pain of their surgery, but to come out of it as well and monitoring. So it's a very advanced education. Most of them are actually, they have do whole doctorates in anesthesia. Uh, so we would, so my bill would, pro it proposes that we join over 40 other states in allowing nurse anesthetists to practice independently within the structure of the hospital system or wherever they're working. Um, I don't know about you guys, but if you've been over and had a colonoscopy or some other type of, it tends, tends to be a more minor surgery, um, like a foot surgery, like I had last year, um, the nurse anesthetist stays by your side and administers all the anesthesia, anesthesia. Um, in Michigan, you have to be supervised by any type of doctor. So a doctor is the orthopedic surgeon actually has no inkling about what <laughs> the specifics of anesthesia, because they're focusing on their um, orthopedic thing, um, like my foot surgeon did, but the nurse actually did the anesthesia and he's signing off saying, Hey, I was supervised this nurse giving the anesthesia and he really isn't. So it's really important that we have the um, buck fall with the right person and let the nurses be independent as they have been practicing. And you know, it's got to come down to a hospital decision. I had Allegan Hospital reach out to me and say, please, we really need these nurses to be able to practice independently. And they actually got to practice independently last year under Governor Whitmer's executive orders uh, during the COVID crisis to make sure that they had the nurses out there to be able to intubate um, patients who were struggling so bad. So that's the bill. And there's a, really quite a bit of controversy. There's a lot of doctors who are worried that um, hospitals aren't going to hire anesthesiologists anymore and get the cheaper nurse anesthetists, which <laughs> doesn't make sense. I mean, I just heard that this morning. I'm like, I think that's taking 10 steps too far to what the ability is because you have to have it in the hospital, the hospital has to approve it. And liability insurance, they're not going to cover a hospital if they don't feel like that person's, they're, they're practicing safely. So nursing power, right? <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. Uh, one final thing, and from time to time, we, we want to bring this up because uh, uh, um, when we get tied up with a lot of the issues and talking about it, then, oh, we're out of time and don't really have enough time to do this. Since we have about a couple minutes to go, how can people get a hold of your office, especially your constituents in Allegan County? to be able yeah. to contact you, uh, maybe with a concern. Yes, maybe the lawmaker may not be at uh, uh, in Lansing conducting business, but the lawmaker's office is always available for constituents. How can people get a hold of your office, Mary? Oh, absolutely. I've got Adam, Amanda, and Alex in the office, um, and they answer the phones, they get all the emails, and then I get back to everybody whenever I can. So the office number is 517 373-0836. And you can email me as well. And it's Mary Whiteford at house.mi.gov. And I do have a Facebook page with all this information as well. Or you can Google my name, Representative Mary Whiteford, and you've got all that contact information there as well. 
I'm just going to ask you to repeat the phone number because people always say, oh, I don't mind my pen and I need to write it down. Yes. So 517-373-0836. And I'd love to hear from you guys. One of my concerns about uh, the efforts in the past to have a part-time legislature is the concern that if there's a part-time legislature, it might end up being part-time office staff as well. And, you know, yes, lawmakers do their work in chambers, do their work in sessions. But to me, the more important work for a lawmaker is to represent the constituents in dealing with state issues, with dealing with state offices, where bureaucrats, they might not listen to constituents, they will listen to their elected uh, uh, representatives. Yeah, we've spent so much time time trying to help people with unemployment insurance. So hundreds and hundreds of calls. Um, I think we dealt with almost a thousand people helping them get their benefits and it's still ongoing. (laughs) We're still having trouble getting people the benefits that they so desperately need. Um, Another thing is treasury. There were people, there was fraud that happened in unemployment insurance and people are now getting um, notices from treasury that they have to return their money or this. And they're like, wait, I never got the money. And (laughs) I mean, it's, it's a mess. So we're dealing with that every single day helping people in the community mental health. I had one woman who had a child at a facility and they're like, you're out of here in 24 hours, severely disabled child, definitely got involved with that. And then another one was a father. He went live on Facebook and told the story about how his teenage son spent 15 days in an emergency room waiting for a psychiatric bed. Mm -hmm. So we got that child to bed the next day and the parents came and testified in my committee to raise awareness. This is real. Mary, thank you very much. We'll talk next month. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bless everybody. Thank you very much, Mary Whiteford on WHTC.